Mr. Pepperoni. Anyways, um, welcome to week 10. Uh, today we'll be talking about more SQL because we're going to talk about pretty much for the rest of the semester. Uh, but this is going to be the uh, significantly more straightforward parts of the language now. Um, the stuff last week is simple until you try to use it and then it gets complicated. Um, and then uh, this is going to be very straightforward today uh, and then get complicated again and over the next two weeks. Uh, but after I'm done today's lecture, I'm going to talk about assignment two. Uh, it has been released. And um, it has been released and updated so that it should be correct uh, for everybody's enjoyment. And the format this week will be similar to last week where I'm going to cover a bunch of slides, do some examples, then I might do some, you know, more slides to make sure I didn't miss anything while doing my examples. Okay, so we are specifically going to be talking about the most basic part of the select statement this week. Um, it's basically the fundamental fundamental framework for a query. So you'll hear, you know, occasionally somebody says, oh, I'm going to run a database query. I'm going to run a query against the database. You know, I'm going to run some SQL to get some data out of the database. They're running a query and specifically they're running select statements. Um, that is the pretty much the only command to run. There's more, but this is the command you use to get data out of a database. And at its most basic, it involves three pieces, select from and where. Um, last week, we already talked about the semicolon thing. We're just ex gonna expand upon, upon the whole select thing this week. There's actually six parts, not three, uh, but we are going to tack on a bunch of these later. However, we've got um, select from and where, and we're actually going to touch order by today. Uh, group by and having is something we're going to deal with later. Uh, the select is, you're going to, that's what you're picking what columns you want back. So you're going to choose what data you're pulling back. Uh, from is saying, you know, from what table. So where do you want to pull the data from? Uh, where is a bunch of condition, conditional booleans. Um, they're known as predicates. So predicate's an important word you want to pay attention to because that may show up on the exam. We'll often use the phrase predicate. And that's not a database only term. It's just, it's not used very much anywhere else outside of database. It's a condition conditional Boolean. So have you guys learned about if statements in Java yet? Okay, so you know I have if in your parentheses and then you've got a condition that evaluates true or false. The where clause is similar to that. Uh, you're going to have a bunch of operations that evaluate to true or false. Those are known as predicates. So technically, what's inside your if statement inside the inside the parentheses? Each expression that evaluates true or false is known as a predicate. It's the same thing in SQL. Um, group by, we'll be talking about that later when we talk about aggregate functions. Same thing with having. Order by allows you to sort things. It's optional. Um, some database servers or have always have a built-in sort order. Postgres does not. Postgres goes most recently touched record last. It's just how it operates inside itself. Um, database servers like Microsoft SQL server tend to always have the data sorted the same way, but that's what order by is for. It lets you sort your data. And that's just more of the same thing. All right, so when we talk about the field list, which is the select statement, you have two choices. You can use the asterisk, which means include all available columns, or you can do a comma delimited list, which is a defined field list separated by commas. So for example, you have select star or select ID comma name. So select star may pull back, if you have a really big table with, you know, 100 columns, it'll pull back all 100 columns. Whereas the second one, I'll only pull back two columns. And some select star is great during development. You should never use select star in production. So when you're writing code, actual real code, 
you should never use select star. And I like to use the example of a sink, the drain in a sink. Fill your sink full of water. You pull the plug. There's only so much I can go down that drain at once. It takes a while, right, for the whole sink to drain down the plug. Same thing happens when you do a select star. So if you do a select star and you're pulling back an entire row, and let's say the row is 1.5K. Yes, I know 1.5K is not big. But then you pull that back a million times. 1.5K times a million is a pretty big chunk of stuff you're pushing, pulling back. As opposed to pulling the ID and the name, you might be pulling back, say the name is 50 uh, characters, plus the ID is an integer. You might be pulling back at most, you know, 54 to 58 bytes. A million times 58 bytes is much smaller than a million times 1.5K. When the web server is living on the same server as the application server, it's not really a problem because it's never actually leaving the machine. But if it's like a proper data center where the database server is sitting on one machine that is designed and optimized for running the database, then you have the application running on another server that is designed and optimized for running the application, there's going to be a pipe between the two, also known as probably a Cat5 or a fiber connection. There's only so much that can go down that connection. And that one query is not the only one running. Therefore, if you've got a bunch of queries that are taking up the entire bandwidth, all the other queries have to wait their turn. And if those queries are big, they're going to make the ones behind them wait their turn. And this just snowballs until eventually you have seconds, if not minutes of delay because you're pulling back too much data. So all that to say, select star is good in dev, never use it in production. Um, there's, there, was, there was a few database profs over the years that would um, not accept anything that has star in it in their submissions. They were that adamant against the concept of select star. It's, you know, not necessary. So if you do a select star and we had a table called customers, we'd get something that looks like this. I'm going to be, be using a different uh, data as my examples. It'll be the same database you guys are using for labs uh, seven, eight, and nine. So that's what I'm going to be doing my examples out of today. So it's going to be data you've seen. In actual fact, I'm probably going to answer some of the questions in the lab by accident. Um, the other thing is I'm going to try to teach you guys something called ANSI standard SQL. Which means it's the SQL that is the closest to work on all servers the same way. MySQL has its things, Postgres has its things, Microsoft SQL Server, Oracle, DB2 all have their things. Like they do a little different from other people. What I'm going to be teaching you guys is to the, the most generic possible version of SQL. That way, what you're learning will be applicable to almost everything else. So if you do a select star, it looks like that. But if you pull back two columns, it looks like that, right? So if somebody felt really enterprising, they go through the slide and count how many bytes each row is, and then multiply it by the number of rows, then you could do the same thing here. I guarantee this would come back much quicker because it's much smaller. Um, you can specify the order of the column. It makes no difference whether you go name, city, or city name, you can, it just changes the order it displays. I'll show you guys that in a minute. Um, and then we have distinct, which I'm actually gonna demonstrate. So I'm gonna drop to my editor now so I can talk about these first couple of things. So you can see what some of the stuff does. Okay, I'm going to run this. You can see it returned 8,000 rows, ran for 442 milliseconds. Cool. That's the whole select star thing. And you will notice that it doesn't go in the order of the primary key. That's just how it happens to be in the database. Now, if I were to say, I just want the name and the city, 
and I run that, 137 milliseconds coming back as opposed to 400. That's a quarter of the time. It's not a quarter of the data, but it's a quarter of the time because there's still overhead, you know, interpreting the command, run the query, collect the results, transmit it back. But what we're saving on is the return time. So this was city name. I mean, name city. I can flip this around and go city, comma, name. And now it's at 85 milliseconds because the database server is caching the query. Like it's seen this query before, so it's not even trying to run it again. It says, I've seen this query before. I know exactly what data I need. I'm just going to change the order. I'm showing it to you. Um, that's another nifty thing about some database servers is they cache the results. So we can change the order of the column to our heart's content. Um, makes no difference. You can even put the same column twice if you want for some reason. Um, there is a purpose for that, but it's not, you know, something totally obvious. All right, so I'm going to go city. And I'm going to hit go. I've just got the city here. And I'm going to throw in a clause that hasn't been talked about yet. Uh, it's probably going to show up closer to the end of the class, but I'll do it now. Order by. Order by allows you to sort the results. So I'm going to sort by city because that's the only thing I'm showing. And now it's sorting alphabetically through the list of cities. If I wanted to sort the other way, I can tell it to sort the other way. I can tell it to sort in descending order. And I'll start by Z, Z first. If you don't, if you want to be explicit, you can be explicit and tell it sort of settingly. That's the default sort order. Um, oh, good. This is perfect right here. So now I'm going to talk about distinct. You'll notice that whatever this city's called, Aiken, um, is in there twice. The distinct keyword returns the distinct values in the results of the query. So if I run this, um, we know it returned originally 8,107. If I run this now, it returns 6,977 because it puts in, it gives you only the first time it sees each of the values and it drops the others. Now with distinct, you have to be careful because distinct operates on the entirety of the row. In other words, if I go distinct, ID, oops, comma, city, how many rows am I going to get? 8,107. Why? Even though Aiken's in here twice, there's two different IDs for the airport. So when you do it distinct, it operates on the entire row. All the values combined, it looks like goes, okay, on all these combined values, show me only the ones that are unique. And it only shows it to you once. So distinct is cool, but if you're pulling things back like the primary key or things that could actually add a lot of variation to the data, distinct kind of becomes useless. But, you know, it serves its purpose. Normally, you don't use distinct with the primary key. You usually just do one or two columns. Um, Let's see how many cities exist in more than one country. 7,127 total airports once I added the country ID, which means we have the same city name in multiple countries, which is not unheard of because there's an Ottawa in California and you know, in, also in Illinois, and they both have airports. Um, so yeah, so this is what the slides are talking about so far. So I'm selecting specific columns from a table. And now I'm telling it be distinct. So it only gave me the unique values. Um, some people may ask, well, what's the point of distinct? Let's just say you have a database that's pretty complex and you have multiple uh, person's email address in there multiple times for whatever reason. And now you want to send out a mailer. Should you send out a mailer to every copy of the email address you have or only send it once? I can guarantee which one's not going to is going to piss off the customer the least. The one, yeah. Not necessarily. 
Um, I'll use an example from my former day job. We, uh, in our CRM, a customer relation management system. So anybody here ever work in customer service? Uh, ever use a CRM? Salesforce, SAP, as one of those things, some ERP system, there's a bunch of them. Whenever somebody would register a trial on our website, we'd put them in as a lead. The thing is that we might have a customer that downloaded version nine of our software, registered it, they became a lead. They never bought. Then we release version 10. They download it, register version 10, they're going into the leads database the second time because they're a new lead. You know they're in there already. Therefore, at that point, we have their email address twice. Or there could be a case of you're trying to retrieve all the orders and a given customer has pulled back more than one order. And it just so happens that depending on how you pull the data back, the email address again ends up getting duplicated. You'd want the distinct values there. So is it properly normalized? It should avoid duplicates unless you actually are intending to put in duplicates. Things happen. Sometimes, you know, the business process is not always very well normalized because, you know, sales reps are gonna sales rep. All right, back to the slide deck. So that took care of distinct. Oh, limit, that was the next one. Uh, limit's a handy one. Let's just say, I wanna know I only want the first five cities alphabetic. If I go limit five, and limit is the very last keyword you'd ever use. No matter how big your query is, limit's always at the end. Lim limits it to five. There's actually, there's an also an offset one, which is not in the slides, but that's basically saying, give me five starting at five. So it'll give you, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Um, but limits really the only one you guys need to worry about. It's a great way to know which one's the first city without ever having to write extra code. Because if you were writing this in Java, you'd pull back the entire list of cities, sort it alphabetically, loop, start the record loop, grab the first record, then break. In the meantime, you could just tell it, hey, Java, run the query and take the first row because there's only ever one row that comes back. You can reduce the amount of coding you have to do in whatever language you work in, like PHP for myself and Java for you guys or Python or whatever, if you leverage the database properly. I guarantee the database server will be much more efficient I work with the data than any code you could write. Maybe in 10 years, your code will be better than what they have in the database server. But right now, I can guarantee whatever comes in, whatever's happening inside that database server will be way more efficient than you. All right. So this cover is talking about select and from. We added the limits so that it, we're, no, we're limiting number of rows. Now we're gonna talk about the where clause. The so last week I talked about the where clause a little bit, talking about how dangerous it is to run certain commands without a where clause, like update and delete. Because if you do an update without a where clause, you're gonna update all the things. If you run a delete without the where clause, you're gonna delete all the things, or at least try to delete all the things. So the where clause is a series of Boolean expressions. We have tons of operators and there's multiple clauses. And I meant to update this slide because whoever put it together was really dumb and they didn't use the right word. It's parentheses, not brackets. It's important to call things the right thing, right? You got parentheses that are round, you got brackets that are square, and you have braces that people also call curly brackets. Uh, they actually have names those things on your keyboard. And it's important to differentiate because Microsoft SQL Server uses brackets to identify objects, not parentheses. Um, every semester I say to myself, I gotta update this slide so it has the right word, it's parentheses. Okay, so the where clause allows you to filter your results. 
Again, this is another spot that the database server will be way more efficient than your code. So SQL requires the use of single quotes when using literal character strings. That's the SQL standard. My SQL is special and it allows you to use double quotes. That's not standard. So the rule is always use single quotes and you have to make sure to use the plain non-directional quotes that you get in basic text editors. I've already had a few students ask me if it's okay to submit their work using a Word document. And I always say, no, because what happens when you type quote marks in Word? It uses the special quote marks, smart quotes, which are not quotes. They're not real quotes. Real quotes are, you know, one character. Um, so a basic example would be select star from customers where regions equal to Ontario. Um, basically put what this is gonna do is it would retrieve all the customers where the region is equal exactly to Ontario. It's a literal string. It's not doing a substring match. It's not doing a partial match. The region has to be equal exactly to Ontario. So this is the equivalent in Java when you go, if variable equal A. And you know, if it's not, even if it's more than the letter A, it's not gonna match because it's not equal exactly to A. So these are what's called a literal string. The value in the field has to be exactly what you feed it. Uh, uh, MySQL, once again, is case insensitive. Postgres is case sensitive. I'll demonstrate that in a moment. Um, we have lots of operators. The first few uh, may look familiar. You will notice the equality check is not equal equal. It's one equal. That one always throws, you know, C-like programmers for a loop when they're first learning SQL because they're used to typing in equal, 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 depending on, you know, what they're working in. We have the diamond operator. We now have the not equal like you guys are used to seeing in C-like languages. You guys are, when I went through school, we only had the diamond operator. The not equal to, I don't even know when that showed up. I just one day, I had a student come up to me and they go, hey, look, this worked. I'm like, damn, I wonder when they put that in. Um, and some people wonder what the heck's a diamond mean? It's like literally saying values less than and greater than. Is it possible for something to be less than and greater than at the same time? Therefore, it's not equal. It's impossible for something to be bigger and smaller at the same time. Therefore, it's their way of saying, hey, it's not equal to whatever this is because it's, I'll accept values that are less than and more than this, but never equal to this. Uh, we have less than, less, or greater than, less than, or greater, you know, less than or equal, greater than or equal. That's the same stuff you guys have seen in Java. <clears throat> Although we have some special ones. We have in and not in, and I'll demonstrate that stuff in a minute. Uh, we have between, which is a range. Not between, which is anything not in that range, like, not like, is null, is not null. Um, I'll actually cover some of these in a moment. So I'm actually gonna just do the demonstration and then I'll see how many slides I'm gonna skip. All right, so I'm gonna go Actually, I'm going to go select star because I'm going to be a bad little programmer and just pull the whole thing back. All right, so we've got a select star. We're going to let it order by city just so that, you know, we always have the same sort order so you guys can witness this. And I can go um, where city is equal to Toronto. And I'm going to run it. And this shows me all the quote unquote airports in a city called Toronto. And you'll notice that it only pulled back eight. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I'm just leaving it there for now. 
It's because I'll show you, be demonstrating other things. I just want to make sure that the sword order stays the same as I'm showing you guys. So I'm just forcing the sword order. So the city is equal to Toronto. Um, I could say city in. And now I'm including two cities. So this is the in clause where it gives it, a, gives it a series of values and it retrieves only where there's matches to those values, excluding everything in, in it. If I were to say everything not in, it would give me everything but Ottawa and Toronto. So that's the in. And you'll notice so far, all I've worked with is strings. I can work with numbers. So I could go where ID equal to 10. And now I'm retrieving row where the ID is equal to 10. So whenever you were, you're working with a web form, you know, like access, and you log in, and then you click on how much you owe, it's probably doing a select star from you know, whatever the numbers are, where student ID is equal to whatever your student ID is. That's how it's pulling it out. Where So it's not showing you, you know, your partners or your buddies or, you know, your mortal enemies debts. It's showing you yours. Which leads me to that whole in clause again. 10 comma 14 comma 15 comma 234. And it's pulling back just those. Sorted by city. In is really handy if you're trying to retrieve like a bunch of values. If, which leads me to uh, the next operator, which is between one and 100. Actually, no, let me go 10 and 100. I have a reason why I want to do that. And I'm going to change this to orders by ID so that you guys can see that what it does. So it'll pull back 10 to 100. Kind of cool. Ottawa is my number, exactly number 100. That's a fluke. I didn't know that. But, you know, here's Ottawa, number 100. And so it's pulling back a range of that. If I go not between... It'll go 1 to 9, 101 onwards. Uh, a lot of people have a problem understanding the concept of what not does. Not negates the value. It doesn't mean between 100 and 110, not those. So it'll, it will not include the goalposts. But the, when you do between, it includes the goalposts. Because it's saying between 10 and 100. Inclusive. Between is an inclusive clause, not an exclusive clause. Um, those are the two big ones that I that the slides just had. Um, so this is uh, the where. We did the operators. Here's the in, not in. I showed you guys that already. Okay. So, you, like again, I've said you guys are blessed because you're working with a modern version of SQL. When I went through school, we didn't have the between operator. Between was not a thing. The way we would have written it is and that will give me the exact same result. Which is going to lead me into the whole multiple clauses thing. It's a good segue into the multiple clauses. So what this is saying is uh, it says, select star from airport where the ID is greater than or equal to 10, and the ID is less than or equal to 100, which is the exact same thing as between. In some ways, this is more flexible because you can choose to not be inclusive. So that would just give me everything from 11 to 99. 
I can turn around with city is equal to Ottawa. And I'm going to purposefully make a mistake. Nope, that's not it. I get nothing. Can somebody tell me why? Hook in the back, he was first. That's exactly it. You can't be two things at once. So that's why a lot of people like the in clause because it takes care of some of this thinking for them. What the or, or clause is actually doing is, what the in clause is actually doing is actually creating an or clause in memory where city is equal to Ottawa or city is equal to Toronto. Oh, absolutely. Heck, man, I can do. I'm just saying, you can put it all in one line and it'll give. It doesn't care. SQL does not care about white space or carriage returns. Like I can have 14, uh, 14 spaces in there. It'll still work. It doesn't care about the spacing. So some people will write it all in one line. Some people put it on multiple lines. Um, there is... Some people like formatting it so it looks like this. Um, I've seen people that like writing all their SQL statements like this so that all the clauses line up nicely. It's just style. Different places will require you to write it differently. There's no point getting hung up on it right now because it may change. All right, so this is the OR clause. We can do an AND clause where we can go uh, city equal to Toronto and elevation greater than 600. And this will give me the two ele ele two airports in a Toronto area that had that are 600 and 600 feet above. Um, sea level. There we go. That's the word I was trying to find. You can you create a bunch of different combinations of these kinds of clauses to refine your results. Now, imagine how would you write this in Java? Let's say you had an entire table full of data. How would you write this in Java? Think about how complicated that would be to write in Java. You'd have a loop and an if statement, and then you'd have a, an array of some sort, which you guys haven't learned about arrays yet, and be popping values into the array. Or you could write a single SQL statement that just gives you a sing, you know, pre-formatted version. That's where I say, you know, like a lot of people look at SQL, they go, ah, it's not that important. You can make your code so much simpler by writing proper SQL. All right, so this is and. Um, we can also throw in an or in here if we want elevation uh, less than 300. And let's see what happens when we do that. And it says, I suck at spelling. So suddenly we here's the situation we got. We're going like, hmm, we're getting stuff that's not Toronto. Can somebody think, tell me why? Yeah, but there's a reason. Yeah, so it, there's an order that it runs. You know, you guys learn about operator order in math, Bedmus. 
SQL has a thing too. Ands are always resolved before ors. So what it's actually doing, and if you actually want to, what it's doing is it's resolving this first. So it's saying, give me everything in Toronto with an elevation of greater than 600 or anything that has an elevation of less than 300. And this gives us the exact same result. If we actually wanted to only worry about the elevation, we put in our parentheses. It'll resolve the parentheses first and then apply the and. So we can change the order how it gets resolved by putting in parentheses. So this is the whole multiple operations thing. Um, oh, you mean, can I, could I, uh, let's see what, so you're saying, if I do this versus I don't know. Let's see what happens. So this was 41.89. And I have a typo. Try that again. 3,958. It's basically, it's using some internal logic to decide which order to do the operations in. So it is now doing anything in Toronto that is less than 300 or anything greater than 600 because it always resolves the ands before the ors. So a good technique to have when you have more than two predicates Start abusing parentheses just to make sure it's doing it exactly what you think it's supposed to run. Because if I were to put parentheses on the elevation, it's going to give me exactly what I wanted, regardless of where the and is. So you have to be careful with the and and the or. So that's the multiple clauses or multiple uh, predicates. When you have more than two and they're not, okay, so if they're all ands, who cares? But if there's more than two and there's an or involved, you're going to want to put parentheses in there to make sure that you're not going to get unexpected results. Um, and I'm an SQL specialist, so SQL is basically what I you know specialized in. Surprisingly, that's not what I thought was going to happen. I went through school, but I have another programmer at my former job where. He's been programming with SQL for 15, 20, almost, almost as long as I have. And he is constantly falling to the parentheses trap. Because he never built the habit of putting parentheses when things get a little bit complicated. Imagine if you're trying to build a complex if clause in Java and you're not using lots of parentheses to make sure that things are being evaluated think they, the way you think they're going to be done. It's the same thing here. Always be very explicit with your thought process because then SQL will behave the way you expect it to. And again, this is another case where, you know, if you look at this, you can see that the SQL is actually fairly um, English-like. Um, so I'm actually going to go back to here and put it back the way I had it originally. Uh, let me just uh, format that. So, well, that's interesting the way we decided to format that, but that's okay. So, if we read it like an English statement, we can go select everything from airports or the city is equal to Toronto and the elevation is greater than 600 or the elevation is less than 300. It literally reads like almost like a sentence or a small paragraph. Usually, if you can read it and it kind of makes sense, you know, as much as it can there's a good chance the statement will work. Is it going to do what you want it to do? You won't know until you try it, and then you're going to spend time refining it. Um, 
speaking from experience, once queries get a little more complicated than this, I rarely get it right on the first try. Like this is basic. I mean, for you guys, it's not. But, you know, once you've done this for a while, this is basic. And when things get a little hairy, I tend to build up my queries piece by piece. For example, for your Java labs and assignments, do you write your entire chunk of code in one sitting and then hit the go button? Or do you write a little bit, hit the go button, fix what might be there, add a little more, hit the, comp the compile button, try it. Does that work? You build it bit by bit. SQL is the same way. You're going to build it bit by bit. All right, back to the slides. Oh, yeah, I took care of that. I already talked about between. I showed you guys not between. All right, so this is a quick summary of those operators in between. The only one we haven't spoken about is null. And you'll notice that SQL has a special clause for null. It's not equal to null. Is is it null or is true for a Boolean? You can also is not null or is not true, which is also a thing as is false. Some, I've seen people write is not true. Um, but there's actually a reason for the is not true, and I'll get to that in a second. So the reason why the data scientists that created the SQL language decided to use the phrase is, to, especially when operating against nulls, is it's a thing that languages like C and Java do that is misleading. And something be equal to null. Think about it for a second. Can something be equal to null, also known as the absence of value? Can you be the equal to the absence of value? There's no, yeah. Yes, but logically, a programming language like C and Java, PHP, Python, every programming language that deals with nulls, treat it as a value, right? They, they've literally defined inside the programming language, there's an actual thing inside of it that says null is a value that is equal to the absence of value. They put in a crutch for you. In SQL, they got clever and they said, you know what? We're creating a language that has to actually deal with concepts. Therefore, null is an absence of value. So therefore, is it null or is it not null? As opposed to equal to null, because it's impossible for a field to be equal to the... Like, you cannot be equal to null. There's no such thing. Even inside Java, when it's doing a checking against null, it's not checking if it's equal to null. It just does a little bit of magic in the background and basically saying, is it null? Um, same thing with is true or is false. Is true, is false is cool. It works. But I said somebody might write, is it is not true? That's because Booleans, and I did say that in the first half semester, in databases, Booleans are actually trinary state. True, false, null. Therefore, you, so you want to say, give me everything that is not true, it would give you false and nulls. Which is why you'd have is not true or is not false, because it would catch everything that is not explicitly that value. Is sounds like a little hokey little. Um, command, like an uh, operator, but it's actually really powerful. Because it not only does the checks against values that don't actually exist, it does it in a way that is semantically correct with the human brain. That's, remember I said last week, SQL originally was written for can you try trying to explain to a manager that the whole thing equal to null, not equal to null, versus is it null? That's one of the reasons why it was written that way. Okay, so now I'm going to dive into pattern matching. So far, everything I've shown you guys has been what you can call exact matches. Oh, I forgot to show you guys one thing before I get to this. So in database servers that are case sensitive, The city's Toronto with a capital T. I'm comparing it to a lowercase Toronto. 
It's not the same string. MySQL is special that way. It's case insensitive. You actually have to tell it to do a binary character match. Postgres goes the other way around. They say, we're always going to be case sensitive and we can choose to not be case sensitive. There's a couple of different ways of doing the not case sensitivity. Um, there is one that is universal. In other words, it works in all database servers. And I will even include it here, city, comma. You have lower, and guess what? You can go the other way. What's it called? Upper. So you can go lowercase, uppercase, eh? Yeah, kind of. Um, I'm going to actually show you guys that as part of the pattern matching thing. Um, because Postgres is case sensitive, they had to make their pattern matching be both case sensitive and not case sensitive. And I'll show you guys that in a second. And a lot of people abuse the pattern matching case and sensitivity to get around the whole that. Um, but for example, Oracle is usually case sensitive. IBM DB2 is usually case sensitive. Postgres is usually case sensitive. MySQL and Microsoft SQL Server usually are not. And Access is not, obviously. So you should just get into the habit of actually coding to the most generic way of handling the problem, which is code for case and sensitivity. This is the version that works everywhere. So this is the ANSI way of writing a case and sensitive query. So I could take this, plop that in MySQL, Oracle, IBM DB2, it would work everywhere. When you guys are doing the labs going forward now, like uh, whatever, uh, lab seven, eight, and nine, there's some cases where it's gonna ask you to match the name of the city or something to that effect. I don't remember exactly off the top of my head. Make sure you're uh, being either matching exactly the way it's written or make it case insensitive. So that's the, uh, the heads up for uh, dealing with strings in Postgres. Lower is known as a string function because we're playing with a string. Did you guys learn about string functions in Java yet? Length, crim. Yeah, that, that's those, all that kind of stuff exists in, in SQL also. There's length functions, trim functions, all that kind of stuff is all here too. Okay. So the like operator. The like operator, and also not like, can be combined with wildcard characters. We have the underscore wildcard character, which represents a single unspecified character in a specific position. Then we have the percent sign, which is zero or more characters until you hit whatever it is you're trying to match. I will demonstrate that momentarily. And then I'll show you guys the case insensitive version of it. Okay. Gonna go back to uh, city like nah, that's not gonna work is it so basically it's saying give me anything that has anything as the first letter that follows with oronto which is always going to be toronto um let me actually go find let me switch to airlines for a second. I just got to get the. That's not going to work. I'm trying to find some that's going to be fairly straightforward to play with.
I'm going to just start playing with my where clause a little bit. Okay. Where name like So this will tell give me anything that has a letter. It has to be one letter. There has to be something there. I R and then anything else. It doesn't care what follows. You can play with this in all kinds of ways. Um, this would say, give me anything that has the word air, lowercase, anywhere in it. So that'll give us Africa Air, Air Cairo. Because as long as air is anywhere, so it's this saying zero or more times, A I R, anything afterwards, zero or more times. And for those of you that are thinking, why is air Cairo being picked up? It's not picking up because of the air, it's being picked up because of the A I R in Cairo. Because it's lowercase. Magic, or I should say anal retentive. We can do a variety of patterns with this. We could go, I want anything that starts with air with a single letter and then a percent sign. And in here, there's only one airline has a lowercase a starting out. Now, some people are going to go, well, that's not all that useful of a query because we're only matching on that. Which leads me to, I like as Postgres specific. I try to stay away from the Postgres specific stuff. This is the Postgres specific way of doing a case insensitive match. So now it's gonna find anything that starts with error regardless of case sensitivity. It is not portable. It will only work in Postgres. How would I make it work everywhere else? And that will give me the exact same result. I prefer if you guys use the portable way of writing stuff. However, I like will be faster in Postgres than the lower function because it optimizes how it looks at the data differently. How does it actually do it inside? I don't know, but it makes a difference. So we can do a variety of matches on um, the air thing. Um, not just air, the, so we could go A, anything R, then anything else. And we go run, and this will give us A, E, R. If I want to make sure that there's a space, I could just put in a space and give me only the things that have a something R. If my database had postal codes in it, you could see some really nifty tricks with postal codes. Which will lead me to the last statement, which I don't have the data here to do the example. For everybody in this group who used an integer for a phone number. You can't pattern match on an integer. You have to convert it to a string and then pattern match. So you're adding extra work. Because if I was well, not related to this, but if I wanted to find anything that was in 613 aerial code, I could have literally gone 613. And that would match everything starting in 613. But this, if this was an integer, or if there was if you didn't have the parentheses, anything in 613. Or I want anything that is um, 555. You can't do that with an integer because you'd literally have to convert to a string and then try to match it. And if those of you that actually want to find a specific uh, exchange, you could actually write it like this. And that would give you anything that's 555 followed by four digits. Pattern matching, even though we only have 
two control characters can be surprisingly powerful. Considering we could also throw in an and and an or and do a, you know, add a little more filtering and eventually you could actually get pretty precise. Um, just the standard way of doing pattern matching in all database servers. Most, uh, most database servers also so, a lot support something called regular expressions. I am not doing regular expressions in class. Has anybody here ever looked at regular expressions? You can you know why I'm not about to touch regular expressions in class, right? It's very powerful and very complex. You can do some amazing stuff with regular expressions, but I know for a while Carlton ran an entire course just on regular expressions. You can actually sign up for a computer science course that was just regular expressions. It's a big topic. Um, I don't know if they still do, but they did for a while. So that's pattern matching. So this is showing anything that starts with DA um, has AN anywhere in it. So this is stuff I was just talking about. Here's the example of anything K something P. So that'd be K2, K1, K3. Um, that might let you match postal codes. Um, here's the null is not null. Um, let me go see. Um, select. I just need to see if I've got nulls in here to play with. I do. Where is null? So it'll give me all the records where ICAO is null. Um, let's see if they actually did fix this in Postgres. No. Because it's impossible to be equal to null. Either you are null or you're not null. So it's either is null or is is not null, which will give me everything that basically doesn't have a null. Please note, uh, let me just change this to uh, the IHA. If you'll notice right here in uh, buzzard in North C, so you got some blanks in here. Null is not the same thing as empty string. Because an empty string is a value. It's empty. There is a set value for being empty. It's not the same thing as unknown value, which is what null is. Null means there's no it's unknown. We don't know what this is. Empty is a known value. It's just it's empty. Uh, is not null. I did that. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about dates. And um, so you guys are lucky because most profs only cover dates with like two lines. But the thing is, there's a lot of things in SQL when it comes to date and time that is not covered by just saying, hey, you want to match a date doing this. Way back in the day, we're, we're going back here, like even before my time, a lot of companies didn't worry about time. They just worried about the dates. What day was this invoiced? They didn't care about when during the day things got invoiced. Modern systems, whenever you include a date, the prevailing philosophy is you always include the time unless it's something that you will never ever need the time. A good example is a date of birth. Other than your mother, nobody cares what time you were born at. Everybody cares, well, somebody might care what your birthday is, but your friends don't care what time of day you were born at. The only other person that might care is if you have a twin because they're older. But most of the time, parents have mixed up the kids anyways. So after the first two weeks, you never know which one was born first. Um, so when you work with dates in SQL, dates are treated like strings, but not quite. So let me just, uh, man, I really wish I had a uh, database with dates in it. Oh, you know what?
I'm just going to go make some data really quick. I'm actually going to go through this thing with you guys very shortly, but um, not today, but next week probably. Um, yeah, that's good. Add a row. Add a date. Um, can I do date time? Fantastic. All right, let's go grab this copy. Just gonna go. Do nope this button here. So now if I go all right, good. I've got dates. And how did it write that date? That's what you get when you try to hurry to show something to someone. Hour. Yeah, that's better. There we go, finally. Okay, now you're gonna, yes. No, not is always after the operator. Is not no. Um, not you can do not between but not is not not is all right so back to my dates now i've got data to work with um do i got anything in here that's close okay so back to here so dates are treated like strings and modern design is you always include the time with it because you can strip off information, but you can never create information. Now imagine if all you were tracking is the date that order is replaced, then your manager goes, well, what time of day do we get the most orders at? If you don't have the time included, you're screwed, right? You're not going to manufacture dates. You could manufacture dates just to, you know, shut them up, but Realistically, you want that data. So you're going to be accumulating that. One of the big issues that people have that they don't understand is if it's a date time field or timestamp field or whatever, you know, it's a field that has both dates and time in it. If you don't specify the time part, it assumes midnight. So where 
sum date is equal to, and I'm going to go uh, 2023-05-29. And I go run. And I will get nothing back. Because what it's actually running is this. which of course will give me nothing. So people go, well, how am I gonna get all the orders on that date? A few ways we can tackle that on. We could go, And that will give me everything from dead midnight on the 29th until dead midnight on the 30th. There's always a small risk that somebody placed an order right at 0000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000. Like we're talking down to the middle of the second. The odds are small. Odds are the, the risk is minimal and it won't affect your numbers, anyways. Um, you can also write it greater than or equal to this. Which will give me the same thing as the between, or I could get more clever just to make sure. And I'll say everything on the 29th and anything that is smaller than the 30th, because I'll start at midnight, so anything smaller than that. So this is where you'll notice that SQL behaves with dates somewhere between a string and a number, because you have to quote it so it looks like a string, but it operates like a number when it comes to comparing values. So with these are the two techniques that are global. This will work in any database server. Every database server has its own way of taking care of this, um, of handling this kind of a problem. The other choice we have is, this is gonna be Postgres specific, You'll notice I threw in a weird looking little thing there, two colons and then a, a data type. Have you guys been talked about in Java yet about casting? Casting. So you cast one data type as another. So you take an integer, you cast it as a string. So you take an integer, convert it to a string so you can act like it's a string. This is what this is how you cast in Postgres. MySQL has got a command called cast. It's a function called cast. So I can now say where some dates equal to 2023-05-29, I'm converting it to a date for the comparison. So it's basically truncating it, so it's dropping off the time. Which one's more efficient? I honestly don't know. I'd have to run benchmarks on like millions of rows to tell you which one's faster. Realistically, you'll never notice the difference. Um, this is the Personally, I like writing that when I'm working with Postgres because it's obvious what I'm doing. Um, you could also do some other stuff, like you could extract parts of the date. So you can extract the year, extract the month, extract the date, and then compare them piece by piece, and that's kind of gross. Um, no. It'll, do, it'll take it. Um, and it might do some stuff. Let's go see if they've... Uh, I honestly don't know what this is going to do. There we go. In Postgres, it says, operator does not exist, timestamp without time zone. You can't, it's basically saying that there's no way to use a like with a timestamp. With the reason I said let's try it, because in MySQL, this would have worked. Kind of. It wouldn't have worked, but it would look like it worked. Um, and now for the other little thing about dates. You know how I've got the date in here as a string? So let me just select it right like that so you can see here's my date, right? And that's with the percentage. So let's take the percentage off. So far it looks like a string. The reason why it's in quotes is this.
you can use SQL as your calculator. You can actually do some pretty, with Postgres, you can do some really complex math. Um, it's got, last time I checked, uh, over 50 different math operators. So you can actually do basic calculus with SQL and Postgres if you want. I wouldn't recommend you try to do that, but you know, in theory, you could do it. So what it's doing is going 2023 20, minus five minus 29. Because the dash is the minus operator. So to summarize what I just showed you guys, always assume that a time, like somebody asks you for data with, with a date, it's going to include the time. You have to account for the time part of the date time. Whether you cast it as a date so you can truncate off the time part or use a between, use greater than or equal and less than, there's different ways of handling it, uh, but dates are gross. Date math is one of the worst kinds of math in computing. Because, you know, some years have an extra day. Almost all years have a few extra seconds. The computer just does it for you. And, uh, yeah. So, that's when they talk about dates. And here's an example of, you know, pulling the string. And this is actually, I was talking about how you do it in MySQL. You use a command called cast. That's the MySQL version of what I just did. Um, so you can do it like this, which is Postgres. You can do it like that, which is MySQL. They're function, fun, uh, functionally identical. Uh, the Postgres one will be slightly more efficient because it's not running a function for every row. It's casting at every row, which is better, I guess is the better way to put it. Uh, I showed you guys a greater than already. Um, I, wasn't sure if, I don't know what the point of this one is. So, oh, the last item is the alias. So, let me go back to this one here. Okay, select star from airports. Go. All right. Alias allows you to rename database objects temporarily. It The renaming is only during the length of the query. So if I want to go name, comma, city, comma, elevation. And I run this query and data comes back. If I wanted to, I can actually rename these columns temporarily. So I'm going to go. And now you can see the name of the columns have been renamed. Some people might be saying, well, what's the point of being able to do that? Uh, sometimes you'll have column names that are kind of strange and you actually want to use the alias to give it a, an easy to work with name. Literally doing the opposite of what I just did, which is, you know, take a complex name, make it something that's easy to work in a programming language. Um, you could also theoretically run this query and export it to a CSV file, a comma separated value file, and therefore suddenly you'd have like an Excel spreadsheet that already has nice headers built into it. Um, there's a bunch of reasons why you'd rename it. I'm actually going to revisit the alias when I start talking about joins in a week, next week, I think, or the week after. Um, and this is where I'm going to throw out a little anecdote. So when I went through school, yeah, go ahead, I'll answer your question first. Those are double quotes. Um, that's pretty universal, double quotes for renaming things. Uh, MySQL lets you use single quotes, Postgres won't. Uh, if you don't have a space in theory, you don't even need the quote marks. So when I went through school and I was learning SQL, I was learning SQL with Oracle 7. Gives you an idea how long ago that was. 
That's what we didn't have. Laptops. So we had to do the work in class. The other thing is that Oracle was running on a, on a mini computer. It wasn't running on the computer we were using. It was running on some computer elsewhere. So how would we save our work for the teacher? We had to print it in class. So we'd be getting, some of our labs would be, I want you to retrieve the records looking like this, and then we'd send it to the line printer. And then we'd be racing for whoever printed the job, right? Because we're all trying to get time on the line printer. The reason why this exists outside of that, because the line printer is a point of the story here, is a lot of old business systems have a bunch of built-in queries with nice headers built in. And when you would print a report for your manager, it would take this report as is with the aliases and redirect it to the line printer. And it would print exactly what you'd have on the screen, but it was coming out to the printer instead. Man, that makes me feel old telling that story because um, nobody does that anymore. But that's how, uh, why this was a really common thing to do back in the day. So you'll still run into old code that's written like this as if the data is going to be pushed out to a file. Uh, even with this, I could, in theory, um, hit a button, export to a file, and let's throw that on my desktop, and go to my desktop, and it's nowhere to be seen. Where'd you go? Let's try that again. Oh, that's because it's in that desktop. This desktop. Save. Go back to my desktop. Here it is. Here's my report. With. My nice header is ready for me to bold. And then you can just give that to your manager. And for those that think that isn't something you'd be doing, trust me, I was doing it for during my last two weeks at my job <laughs> a lot because they wanted as much data as they could out of me. Um, so that's one of the powers of alias. Um, and I just covered that one. We can actually rename a table, but I'll talk about that when I'm talking about joins. These are more samples of aliases. Okay, that's the end of the slide deck which puts me right on schedule for my next topic. Assignment two. Yay. All right. Once again, group work, same lab sections. So, no, you don't have to use the same partners as last time if you don't want to. I've already had somebody ask me that. No, you don't have to use the same scummy partners. Okay. It will have four files. You must submit it as four separate files, not one file. Complete breakdown of the points. There is a diagram. I'll show you guys the diagram in a minute. It's attached to the end of this assignment. But you will create a DDL command file, which creates your database. If that sounds familiar, it's lab six. You're going to look at the diagram. You're going to create the commands to create the database. And you will be marked on how accurately you are. As in, you're going to do the data types the same. Field names are identical. Table names are identical. You are not allowed to get creative. This is literally a mechanical piece of work. You can leave your creative at home in your drawer. Yeah. That's normal. So no, there's some logic behind it. And I'll sh I can touch on that when I show you guys the diagram. So there's a DDL file. 
This For this assignment, you're literally going to be graded on how close to the diagram you can get. Because in the real world, when you're first starting out, you're not the one creating the databases, the designs. There's probably a database architect, a database designer who's going to create the designs and give you a diagram. They're not going to want the snot-nosed, brand-new programmer thinking they know better than what they've been doing for years. They're going to want you to implement it exactly the way they made it. It's just how it's going to be. Um, then you're going to have a section for test data. That's also lab six, part B, where you're inserting rows. You need to populate the tables. And people ask me, well, how many rows of data do I need? I, I, the answer is you need enough data in there to prove that part three of the assignment works. So part A between groups should be like 95% the same. Part B should be 0% the same between groups. Because that's where the variation, I mean, if you add a dozen rows and it's identical to his dozen rows and he didn't work together, something smells. Unless you guys are like joined at the brain, you shouldn't be coming up with the exact same data. So queries. So, so far you've had enough to do the first half of the assignment. Lab six basically covers assignment part one, part two. What I covered today and what lab seven covers is a part of part three. There'll be the next couple of weeks to fill in the rest. Um, it's a series of queries and you will notice that none of these queries specify anything specific. Every group should be able to write their own queries and they don't have to be the same as another groups. Because if you have different data, your query should also be different. So it is what it is. Make sure you go through the point guide. Uh, essentially, um, that one there is pretty straightforward for points though. There's 35 points for the queries, two points for the comment block. Like if you put your freaking name in the file, you get two points. And actually, let me go back up really quick. Two points for the comment block. Two points for the comment block. You're seeing a pattern here? I want you to put your name on your work. So there's a series of queries and it reads like a simple query that pulls all columns and rows from a table. You pick the table. You write your select star from whatever table. Bam, there's number one. Uh, it gets more complicated as you get down. But, you know, there it is. Then you have views. Uh, I'll be talking about views close to the end. I am going to slam it in right at the end of one of the other lectures. Um, I'll give you guys the quick and dirty version of the views lecture so that you have time to do it. It's the last item. Um, so that it's fairly straightforward. Oh, and back to the, que the queries. The reason I was uh, talking about that, it's 35 points because there's two points for the comment block, three points for every query, one point for submitting a query that matches like, number one, you gave me a query. If you write the same query for all 11, you're not going to get your points for that. It's you wrote a query that more or less attempts to what you're trying to do. Two, does it work? In other words, I hit the run button. Does it work? Last point is, does it actually do what I'm asking you to do? So you get a point for giving me a query where you tried. You get a point if it actually runs. And you get a point if it's actually what it's supposed to do. It's actually pretty generous. Um, all right. So then the diagram. This is the diagram. This is the diagram created specifically with a tool for creating Diagrams for Postgres. This is actually a real database. It's actually been simplified. I actually took a few things out. Uh, I stripped out a few items in here. Now to get to his question about how everything is called ID. I'll use the tags section at the corner here. You have tags, primary, call ID is, primary column is ID, name. Look at the foreign keys, recipe underscore ID. 
This is the ID of arrest. Uh, sorry, tag underscore ID. This is the ID of a tag. No, I created it that way. I designed it like this. That's the naming conventions I chose for this diagram. Some other people would have called it tags underscore ID. Other people in the tags table would have called the primary key tag ID. This is just showing you that there's all kinds of ways to skin the same cat. There's whatever place you work will have the naming conventions they choose to use. They're all going to be a little different. When you look at this diagram, Tag underscore ID represents the ID of a tag. Where do we find the tag? In the tags table. This ID here matches the ID there. And the whole diagram follows the exact same uh, naming convention. Here's recipe. Recipe underscore ID. In recipes, the primary key is called ID. There is actually a programming reason for using this particular naming convention. Um, this is because the way this is all laid out right now is known what has become a de facto standard in the industry. Not everybody has adopted this standard. Essentially, anybody here ever hear of something called Ruby on Rails? One guy. That just goes to show you how popular that language was. So Ruby was a language somebody created because they thought it was they could write a better language than Perl. And they called it Ruby because Ruby is more valuable than pearls. Stupid. And everybody thought Ruby was amazing because it had this thing called Rails. Rails was a framework. And so everybody realized that Ruby as a language sucked, but the concept of Rails was cool. So they took the concept of Rails and ported it to Python, ported it to PHP, ported it to C Sharp. All these other languages now have their own frameworks. And as these frameworks were ported, the Rails conventions You can have the conversation later. The Everybody was following very similar conventions. So now anybody who writes code for the web that uses a backend framework, whether it's Flask for Python or Cake PHP or Laravel or whatever it is in Java or C Sharp, they all have frameworks. A lot of them follow the same name conventions. Basically, Microsoft and IBM and a few other big companies have all agreed that this naming convention is good. As because it allows them to simplify the internals of their framework. But yeah, that's the naming convention. That, that's why it looks the way it does. It's a pretty standardized naming convention. So you will create a database that follows this structure. Um, it's a database that lets you store recipes for families. So you could have a family with users in a family, and they all share recipes. Because, you know, those of us that have family where they had some amazing recipes and then they, you know, the grandmother passes away and nobody knows how to make those cinnamon rolls ever again. And some of us are not bitter about not ever having those recipes. This was the, this is a structure behind a database uh, for sharing recipes. There's no code in front of it, but that's a concept where you could sign up a bunch of people from the same family and they can all put their recipes and share them with each other, but yet still have their own you know, entries. So you got spot for users, you got spots for family, you can assign users to a family. In theory, you could put the same user for multiple families. Um, you can assign recipes to specific user, that kind of thing. Uh, recipes have comments, tags. You guys know what tags are, you know. Ground beef, you know, vegetables, you know. Will give you heartburn. Those are kind of tags you could put on a recipe. So the goal is you will create a script for this. You will populate it. You will create queries for it, create a couple of views. You will submit these files. You'll be great on how well your it runs. And whether or not obviously you meet this, you know, does it create uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight tables? We'll look at the tables. We'll spot check the tables, make sure the tables have the right number of columns, they have the right data types, um, that kind of thing. When people say, how many rows of data do I need? It's up to you. Do you need to populate every single column? 
Not necessarily. But you need to have enough there to prove that whatever queries you choose to run work. And I've had people that have done one row of data in every table just so they could write the queries. Fine, they got the points for working queries, but they didn't get the points for test data because there has to be enough test data there. Um, next week, time permitting, I'll show you guys how to use generatedata.com. It's a really cool tool to generate. That's what I just used really quick to create that table today. Uh, and because I was hurrying so much, I actually kind of screwed up like three times. Um, but it's a really good tool for handling this kind of stuff. Um, outside of that, that is it for today. That's assignment two and the lecture for today. Uh, Lab 7 has been released, but obviously you guys probably aren't going to be working on it until next week. Today covers everything you need for Lab 7.